without having to be an expert at the core uh, Verilog stuff. And, and this slide I, I put up really is motivation for why this is important. And it compares you know, our first generation devices. So we had USERP ones which didn't even have hardware multipliers. You had to use fabric, right? That's 10 years ago at this point. To our Gen 2, this is USERP M210. And then now our two Gen 3 devices. And you can see how much more FPGA capability there is there. And, uh, and, and But there's also more of a need for using it because although general purpose processors have gotten faster, uh, latencies really don't shrink, um, and uh, the things we want to do have gotten uh, harder and, and bigger. So, uh, so the question is, how do we take advantage of these huge FPGAs? And uh, in particular, I like to say that the um, you know FPGAs are scaling with Moore's law, but um, our budgets do not. Our uh, number of employees, our number of grad students, our time of the day does not scale with Moore's law. And so, if we want to be able to take advantage of all of this uh, capability then we need to scale ourselves. And, and the, way, the way we do that is through tools and, and abstraction and uh, um, systems to, to make uh, developing complex systems better and, and reduce the amount of work that you're doing that could be done by the computer. And, so, um, and also, uh, people who are experts in algorithms, people who want to concentrate on software or radio, don't necessarily want to uh, be worrying about flip-flops and hand gates and, and things at the low level and, and buffering and, and that sort of thing. And it's really it's the same thing we did with Google Radio, which was enable people who, who care about radio to build things without having to be experts in operating systems and all that stuff underneath. And so, so that's what we're doing with RF NOC. Um, there's, there's a, you know, you can see the whole list of, uh, of, of motivations here, but um, FPGA reconfigurability is difficult, and development is, is a large part of that, not just the compilation time. Um, and it's also very hard to scale designs beyond one FPGA. Uh, and so, so we've tried to address all of those things with RF NOC. So now, if we can do that, if we can be successful with that, that enables uh, uh, us to treat FPGAs like something other than a rewritable ASIC. And when I say that, I mean a rewritable ASIC to me is is what we do now is we, we make one image that does a certain thing, right? It's customized to our application, and then you have to wipe it and do something completely different for a different application. And, and so that, that's missing some of the value of what an FPGA can give you. And, and so I, I think there's two, two aspects to making this problem easier uh, that are mostly orthogonal. The first is how to uh, express algorithms efficiently uh, as a designer. And, and, and make them compile efficiently in the FPGA. And then the other axis is how do you take those algorithms and tie them together in a bigger system? So we are not tackling the first. There are a lot of people who are tackling that problem, uh, whether it's uh, MyHDL or, or, or Bovato HLS and, and, and other tools that, that are, are good at expressing algorithms. What we're tackling is the other axis, which is how do we take those algorithms, put them together in a large system that we can now scale, and, and, and flexibly use them and, and, and uh, be able to say, okay, I have these building blocks available, which ones can I tie together? So this is really the vision. This is a, a plain old GNU Radio uh, 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 flow graph, and to me the essence of this is that I can drag and drop blocks from the list, and I can put them together, because they all have the same port color, I know that they'll connect. It might not do anything intelligent, if I have to add that intelligence, but I know that these are all streams of floats, and, and because they are streams of floats, they'll connect, and it'll at least send something through. And, but we don't have that yet for the FPGA, and that's what, that, that was the motivation for, for what we're doing here. Um, now, this is where we, we're coming from. This is the, sort of the traditional FPGA data flow. In a, and this, is, in particular, is what we have in a, in a USERP uh, 2 series device, an N210 kind of device, where you have, just, just as an example, samples would come in on the A to D, you have a, a digital up and down conversion, and then a decimation, and then it would go into the host. Now, let's, now there's room in these FPGAs, and we put little access points. We have, it's easy, you can add, add code here, here, or here for your algorithm. So if you wanted to add an FFT, you might add it after the decimator. And you wanted, or if you wanted to add a fur filter, you might add it after, before the decimator, let's say. But what happens uh, if, if you don't know ahead of time where you want to add? Or if you have a whole bunch of different things you want to add, and sometimes you want to bypass them, and sometimes you want to use them, all of a sudden you have this, this mess of, of routing and interconnect logic, and, it, and, and then you have to create custom host code to control it, and, and it, just, it, it just doesn't scale your time well. And so uh, what we've done instead is 
um, we developed the RF NOC, and, and this is a, a diagram of what actually goes on inside an X300. And, and so things you can see are, uh, the, the structure is quite different. So um, the, the four major components, and I'll go into more detail on each of them in a bit, are the radios, and by radio this is actually what happens in the FPGA to control the radio and also uh, samples and that, those sorts of things. It's not just the hardware. The hardware of the radio would be out here in the diagram. We have a, a router that connects everything. We have interfaces to the outside world. And then we have a sea of computational elements. And not necessarily just four, just four drawn there. Um, and that allows you to, um, to, to, do, uh, to do things in a, in a different way because there's no, there's no hard-coded paths because you have this router, which is a dynamic router. And so what that enables you to do is something like this. And this is what um, Jonathan is going to demo in a little bit, where we have a, one flow graph. And some of these blocks are happening in the FPGA, and some of them are happening on the host, and it's it's transparent to to your application. You essentially you choose the RF NOC fur instead of the, the host code fur. And but this doesn't need its own FPGA image. As long as you build an FPGA image that happens to have the RF NOC fur and the RF NOC FFT in it, then it'll it'll run. And you can put them in any of the slots you like, and it'll just figure it out and get get the get the stuff there. So, so that's the, um, the realization of that vision. And um, so <clears throat> I'll just go into, uh, uh, does everybody get what, what the goal is and where we're, we're going with that? Great. Um, so now I'm just gonna talk about some of the principles of how we make this actually function. And so, um, so first, RF knock is a, is a distributed asynchronous implementation of con process networks. That's sort of a, a, the CS uh, answer of, of what, what we're really doing. But, um, uh, essentially, we're creating a large distributed system of independent FIFO-connected computational units. And I, I think Khan was in the early 70s. I, I go to Eric as our, our, our CS guru. Um, and, and, but it, as a concept, and, and what we've done is we, we've made that so you can build them in a practical sense. Now, we don't have the infinite FIFOs that, that are in the postulated Khan process networks, and so you have to mo uh, deal with that. And, and we, do, we deal with that by using flow control. Um, and we'll get in a little bit into the flow control later. The protocol is somewhat similar to Rapid IO. They had some uh, similar concepts, um, but it's a little bit heavyweight for what we were trying to do uh, within the FPGA. Um, but the, the, the basic block has, has two interfaces, uh, a, a FIFO in and a FIFO out to the, to the system. So uh, in, in this diagram, all of, these, all of these lines are a 64-bit FIFO this way and a 64-bit FIFO that way. And, and that's essentially it. The other, the other, uh, the blocks don't have any other wires to each other. And that um, actually really reduces the complexity of the system. We now have an API, which is, which is something that really hasn't been in the in the hardware design world, in the FPGA world. Uh, we, it, it, it's you know everybody's known known about that in the software world for years, but <coughs> making things interoperate and connect as components in the hardware world has been uh, lagging. Uh, there, there have been people doing it, and there's uh, different efforts, but uh, they've always been pretty focused on, uh, on other applications. Um, so what goes over these FIFOs? These FIFOs can, can carry uh, data or control, so da and data can be baseband samples, symbols, packets. We don't specify what you carry in the packet. Um, it, it can be anything you like. Um, so in that sense, RF knock is sort of the transport layer in this network. Um, then you can put anything in those packets. At, and, but because data and control are over the same packet format and are over the same connections, you're able to uh, uh, have blocks control each other and you, you can have any-to-any -any communications, which means there's no host computer necessary in the system. Um, and, or you can have many host computers. No, no one really needs to be the host. You can have just a lot of processing units. And, um, and, and to, in order to make that work, you need to do flow control, uh, both fine and coarse, and there's a, a bunch of other stuff to actually make this function. But the principle allows you to create these, these large systems. Um, one very useful thing is that because these are FIFO interfaces, each block can be in its own clock domain. And anyone who's developed on FPGAs knows how, how useful that is. And by not having lots of cross-interconnected wires between everything, and just having a simple interface, it makes place and route easier, it makes meeting timing easier, it makes partial reconfig easier because you have a well-defined interface that you can cut and paste little pieces into. So uh, the first of the four blocks is the radio blocks, that's these orange blocks on the right side. 
And so the, the concept of the radio block, the, today what's in the radio block is essentially everything that's in the USERP N210 DSP section. So it's got the decimation interpolation and the uh, um, uh, frequency conversion. It has the, um, the IQ balance correction, all of that stuff. The stuff that's tightly associated with a physical radio is there. And it, and it also has all control of the hardware. So it's what turns the amplifiers on at the right time and all that sort of thing. It is the only block that has uh, a precise notion of the real world time. Every other block operates completely asynchronously. And the way you're able to do that and still maintain precise timing for your signals is that we have time stamping. So any samples coming in get time stamped, and that's at the head of each packet. And, uh, and samples going out have a time stamp, and they're not transmitted until that time. And so this allows for precise control and uh, uh, complex protocols and TDMA and all that stuff, while at the, same main, at the same time keeping all of your computation, or the bulk of your computation, asynchronous. So we try to minimize actually what's in the radio blocks, and we could even take out the up and down converters and, and, um, and stuff, and uh, uh, interpolators and decimators, and take them out of the radio blocks and put them into computation engines. Um, there's, there's not really an advantage or a disadvantage to doing that, so we've just sort of left them there. But um, you could completely bypass them and use uh, computation engines for all of, all of that. So this, the radio block is the interface between the knock world and analog voltages on the outside. Uh, then there's the computation engines, which are the, the blue blocks at the bottom here. And so uh, the computation engines are really, they're, they're why we're here. Um, they're the, the whole point of the system. So um, some of them are obvious, you know, some things are obvious candidates to be put in a computation engine. So a FUR filter, FFTs, OFTM mods, OFTM sync, that sort of stuff. Uh, turbo coding, all that kind of thing is, is kind of an obvious application. There are also some things that may not be quite as obvious uh, as to why they, um, they fit well, but because we have the, the capability of doing control, you can imagine doing things like state machines, so frequency hopping state machines, AGC, higher level protocols, stacks, those sorts of things can also be in a computation engine. And your computation engine doesn't have to be hard-coded logic. It could be a, um, it could be a microblaze CPU. It could, be, uh, um, it could be a GPU on another device. It, it, because this is network transparent, it, your Core i7 or your, your cluster of Core i7s can each act like computation engines and participate in the network just like pieces of the FPGA. Our focus is on the FPGA, making things efficient in the FPGA, but you can also do things outside of it as well. Um, now, there are certain things that are not really good candidates for computation engines. So one is, is very, very fine-grained things like uh, adders or multipliers. You wouldn't want to make, I mean, you could, and it would function, you could make an adder computation engine, but that, that's, uh, there's too much overhead when you do things like at that granularity. What makes more sense from a granularity standpoint is what you would call an algorithm. Or, or a, a major step in an algorithm. But you don't want to have adders, multipliers. It's just like in computer radio, you can make an adder, you can make a multiplier, but r really you don't want to build your fur filter like that. You want to build your fur filter from the fur filter block and then use blocks. So really this is, these computation engines are, are like work functions in computer radio. It, it, it's, it's really, it's a very nearly direct mapping to what the, the work functions do. So um, we have external interfaces, uh, which are the, the red blocks all the way on the, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, gray blocks all, uh, on the left side. And so the external interfaces are what adapts between the, the RF knock world and the outside world. So uh, you know, a packet, it, it comes in uh, from, uh, on the ethernet interface and the R external interface determines if it's a knock packet. If it is, it strips off all of the ethernet and IP and UDP and stuff and sends it into the right ports. In the, uh, in the crossbar. If it's uh, on the way out, it, it, it looks at the RF knock address and then adds on the appropriate Ethernet framing, for example. And there's the equivalent for PCI Express and USB and uh, also the interface to the ARM in, in a Zinc chip. Um, uh, and so we've, we've built all four of the first, uh, the, all, all of the first four things there. Um, but you can also imagine having adaptation le layers to other things like GPUs, massive multi cores. Uh, those sorts of devices uh, could also fit in, in this space. Um, so, it, and just by way of example, so this is what happens in the X300, right? We have the transport router, we have the radios, the computation engines, and the interfaces. So it has PCI Express and dual 10 gb But on the E300, you, you just remove this stuff and you have 
the interface to the zinc a part of the, uh, uh, the ARM uh, interface in the FPGA, and all of the rest of it stays the same. We use the same router, the same radios, and the same computation engines. And it allows you to go from the high-end device to the handheld to, the, to uh, across all the devices. And because there's seven series FPGAs from Xilinx, they'll, they'll have similar performance characteristics. But it's, you know, again, not tied to any specific FPGA. So external interfaces, you know, basically just map from the knock world to the to the outside world. Uh, and then we have the network fabric in the middle. This is the big uh, big green box in the center. So this inter uh, this block uh, is a, a full crossbar, and um, you should think of this as and this is a critical distinction. Everything is packet switched, not circuit switched. Right, so it's not like the telephone network, it's like the internet. Any packet can go anywhere, and the way you know where, where to send it is what address is put on the packet. Now, the, the nice part of this is the blocks don't need, to, uh, don't need to have fixed connections to each other. They all can communicate to all uh, of them. And so any block can talk to any other one, and you, know, you, know, you can talk to one block and then talk to a different one on the next packet and switch around. And so that gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, the other thing is that the, the crossbar and the other hardware in the center handles all the routing. So your, your packets just need to say where you want them to, the, the destination address of where you want them to go. The system figures out where that is and how to get there. So it sets the crossbar appropriately. If it's on an external interface, it set, sends it uh, externally appropriately. And you don't have to worry about that. The individual blocks don't care. They just know addresses. And they don't even need to know that it's not in this FPGA. It's in a different one. It's across the world on another uh, device. Um, and uh, and it's all transparent. So just uh, the, just to skip ahead a little bit, the this is what we call a simple MIMO example. It may be a bit much to call simple, but it's got uh, this would be 16 antennas, and because we have the dual 10 gate Ethernet ports on uh, the X300, you can daisy chain these devices, so you don't even need an Ethernet switch. But you can imagine this radio sends samples in here. This block the term does a. a, a uh, a detection, a, a blind uh, detection of what kind of modulation it is. He determines, oh, this is GMSK. I, I know the GMSK needs to get sent to computation engine number 37 to get processed. But computation engine number 37 might be here. It, it will, the system will handle the task of getting it there and processing. And so everything is mixed. Now, in a network like this, there's only so much you want to scale like that because you, you start to saturate the individual links um, uh, because, uh, because of the daisy chain nature. But with 10 gigabit, you've got to do a lot to saturate that. Um, but you can also, uh, this is all transparent to network switches, so you can just connect everything into the 10 gig switch, which um, have gotten remarkably inexpensive for what they provide. Uh, these days you get 48 port switches for, for less than $6,000. Um, and you could, that means you could hook up 48 chains of devices, and you can, you can gang switches together. You can have multiple computers on there that are also acting as computation engines doing their own uh, tasks, and, uh, and the whole network doesn't all have to be doing one app. You might have you know, these guys doing one app and these guys doing a different app, and, uh, and, and it's all transparent to you when you're programming it from uh, your flow graph. So um, what, what really makes a, a lot of this work, and uh, you know, anytime you see a, a network uh, like this, you, you should be, the first thing you should be concerned about is congestion and, and uh, and uh, uh, you know guarantees of, of latency and those sorts of things. And what really makes this work, what makes it function, what makes it scale, is the way we do the flow control. And um, this has a, a little bit of detail on it. If you want, we can go into more of it later. But essentially, there's two pieces of the flow control. There's the fine-grained, which everyone who's dealt with a FIFO knows about fine-grained. There's the, the ready-valid or different systems. They call it different things. Uh, but then there's the coarse-grained flow control. And that's when, when can I send a packet and, and when can, do I have to hold it because the guy I'm sending it to doesn't have space for it. And the combination of those two allows you to make certain guarantees about performance. So you can reason in an automated way about what's your worst case bandwidth, what's your worst case latency, what, um, will there be congestion, will there be blocking, um, and, uh, and, and make guarantees on that rather than having to sort of run things for a really long time and see if it ever clogs or simulate it forever. You can, you can reason about this in an automated way. And that, that's very powerful. So um, the, the basic concept is that it, it, no block sends data into the network unless he knows his recipient has buffer space for it. 
And, and that's, that's a simple rule. Actually implementing it is a little more difficult. But, uh, but the nice thing is we've implemented it in a way that you don't have to re-implement it. You can just use it. And, uh, and, so, um, and that comes to our, our concept of wrappers. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. And there is some overhead to it. Um, it's not a lot in terms of logic. Uh, but the idea is that not everybody needs to reinvent invent that wheel. And so we have wrappers that allow you to take your simpler logic with a nice, simple interface and throw it into the system quickly. And so we have wrappers for Verilog. that it, Well, it'll work with Verilog, VHDL, and anything else that Xilinx can compile. Um, eventually, the goal is to have wrappers for other things like, um, like uh, MyHDL and, and Simulink and Bovato HLS and all, other tools like that. Uh, but for now, we have anything that Xilinx directly compiles will work. And so, uh, so this is really this is the sort of the status of where we are. Um, and Jonathan and Martin will come up in a moment and, and uh, um, do the demo for you. But basically, we've got a working implementation of radios, network fabric, interfaces, flow control, all that stuff. I mean, this is what's in all the X300s we shipped. This everybody's essentially running this uh, without computation engines today. Um, and so, uh, but we have a number of interesting computation engines that have been implemented. Um, we have the automatic setup and routing uh, based on the flow graphs. And we can build FPGA images just by you selecting engines. So you don't have to touch the Verilog. You don't have to mess with, with um, the, the guts of things. Um, things still in, uh, to be done. Um, uh, more interesting computation engines, full applications like 802.11 or, or that sort of thing. Um, take advantage of partial reconfig um, and uh, produce more uh, reference uh, skeletons for, uh, or wrappers for other uh, design environments. Um, in my HDL in particular is, is, is pretty interesting. It's open source and it's uh, Python based. Uh, and uh, it's been around a while. Um, and so, so we're very interested in that one in particular. And uh, the PhD thesis that could come out of this is, is figuring, is having the computer figure out where to put everything and automatically migrate the processing from the host uh, to the computation engine. For now, you have to tell it, okay, this one's on the host, this one's on the, on the FPGA. So with that, I'll let, uh, uh, these guys uh, give you the demo, and uh, while they're getting set up, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Yes? Um, in the GNU radio example you showed with a couple of different blocks that are, I guess, computation engines in the FPGA, mm -hmm. um, I guess when you put several of them in series, do you already figure out what all stays on the FPGA so you're not passing buffers back and forth between the host and the yeah. FPGA? Yeah. So, one, just sort of an inherent difficulty anytime you're you're doing this is you kind of don't want to do some things on one and say, you know some things in the host and some because you end up passing things back and forth. Um, the the tool the way it's set up as you'll see in the demonstration makes it obvious what is happening within the FPGA and what crosses the boundary, and um, and that makes it easier for you to see. Uh, um, I, I don't know if we tried crossing back and forth yet. We have it. Does it? It actually works. Okay, so yeah, so you can cross back and forth. It's one of those, you shouldn't do it. But, um, uh, but in, in the case where you have something that's very easy to do in the host code and something else that's very easy to do in the FPJ and they don't cross over well, you can do that. Um, and the, to me, the, the best thing the tool can do is not make that decision for you, but make it obvious what's actually happening. And, and so that's, that's where it is. Anybody else? Uh, yes, over here. So they, there's no reason you couldn't sort of backport it to that, except the FPGAs are small enough on the older devices that it's not, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to fit very much, is, is how I would put it. Um, there, there's, there's, no, there's nothing preventing it, but we're not going to put effort into moving it back there. We're concentrating on the 7 series devices from Xilinx, and everything's very well tuned for that. Uh, in particular, the crossbar is, is it, it, the 7 series can very efficiently make that crossbar, and the other previous ones, it, it's, it's kind of messy. Uh, uh, yes, there's someone in the, uh, there in the, yeah. Is there any plans, are there going to be plans for other vendors to be able to take advantage of other hardware vendors? Yeah, so this is um, open source, uh, and so uh, we, we will also be um, uh, dual licensing it, so there'll be a, a, a very open source friendly, share and share alike kind of license. We're, we're in the finalization steps on that. And then there'll be the, the alternative license. Just like UHD, there's UHD has GPL and there's the 
the non-commercial. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, the so on under uh, yeah. So if another vendor is using it, they're going to need to be abiding by GPL uh, equivalent uh, policies. Yes. So this is not shared memory. This is actual FIFOs. Okay. So it, everything moves along uh, paths. Yes. Uh, could you quantify the overhead taken up by the RF, uh, like the crossbar fabric and other parts of this uh, okay. for a given standard? I don't okay. Know. We do have those n numbers. It, it's um, I, and I, I can get them for you. O overall, it's it's surprisingly little. Um, the per block overhead is pretty low. The the crossbar has some moderate. I mean, you're, we're talking a 16 way. 64-bit wide non-blocking crossbar. So there's, there's some overhead to that, but it's surprisingly low. And as the FPGAs get bigger and bigger, the, the overhead becomes less and less important. Okay, well for, like, for instance, for the E300, how much does that consume load? So, okay, so if you've got, it, it, yeah, so the E300 is, is you, you've got a lot of empty space even with the infrastructure in there. We, we, and it, it's sort of always in flux, but we can give you, we can give you more detail, but it's surprisingly low overhead. There was somebody in, in the in the back. I, I can. I don't. I don't mean to not fully answer that. It's just hard to give Saul's numbers like that. Right. So we have a full. We basically have a make file that will then build in the Xilinx tools, and it'll add in the. Correct blocks. Uh, we don't do anything exotic with it, uh, at least not yet. A build? Yeah. Uh, baseline builds on an X300 or like uh, an hour or so. Um, but uh, the um, at some point we'll be moving to Vivado, and hopefully that will get faster. Um, but uh, yeah, the, you know, the more you throw in there, the, the worse it's going to get. It's not any. Uh, the reality is, it actually is probably easier for the tool because everything is so compartmentalized. Yes, we have full simulation. So every RF knock block, you, we have uh, uh, Verilog simulation tools that then connect into GRC that will give you, uh, so you can generate a signal in GRC, send it through the simulation, come back and do a graph of it within GRC. So it's, it's pretty well integrated there. There's a bunch of debugging tools that we have. Uh, there's never enough, but there's a, there's a whole bunch there that um, uh, to, to make this process easier. Doug. Uh, so OpenCPI has kind of a similar Okay, so I, I'm not heavily familiar with OpenCPI. They, they do have a kind of a, a, a similar goal. Um, I think in some senses their goals were more general and that some, can result in a higher overhead, but I, um, yeah, I, it, my expertise in that is limited to, it's a similar goal, uh, but uh, we didn't feel it fit well for what we were trying to do. Yes. We are currently using ISE, and we hope to transition to Movado in the very near future. Yeah, yeah, you'll have all that. Our, our suggestion is you try and stay within the computation engine because uh, we've made a lot of effort so you don't have to look at the other junk, but you, you will have that code and you'll be able to you know, do with it uh, as you will. You, you, you can shoot yourself with it too. Um, you know, shoot yourself in the foot with it. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Martin and Jonathan do the demo. Okay. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to say were actually covered by the Q&A. That's, that's great. It'll save us some time. Um, so I was mainly, like in my effort in this whole thing was mainly on the host side. Um, and that actually splits into two parts, which you can't really see from this demo, which is well, why I'd like to talk about it. So we have some changes to UHD, obviously. So UHD is the USRP hardware driver, you know, the stuff that runs our hardware. And um, you know, that's, that's coming along pretty well. Um, it's in a fairly good state. And the other uh, modifications are obviously to GNU Radio, and um, so on the GNU Radio side, I'd like to say I'd like to say this this all works, but this is right now not in a state that we can sort of immediately upstream it back into GNU Radio because we you know did, did some changes, 
And um, I was talking to Doug earlier, we could sort of talk about this in the, um, uh, the Accelerator and Co-Process Working Group later today. And um, so uh, if I understood Doug correctly, where is he? Like I saw him, wait, oh, so behind the pillar, yeah. So that, so there will apparently be, be time for that. Um, and also, <laughs> um, there was the changes to the Radio Companion. Um, so, which we like, I like. We'd, we'd like to figure out a good way to sort of upstream that again, in a you know, in a way that suits the Kinder Radio project and does, does not just have like an RF knock, um, you know, flag and Kinder Radio companion because that kind of that would be not generic enough. So just to give you sort of a quick rundown of what's happening while Jonathan is setting it up. So this is like a general. You you know what GRC flow graphs look like, and you can kind of like just by reading the blocks can understand what's happening. We have a source and it goes through blocks, and at the end we're gonna have a um, FFT sync to like show the spectrum and there's an FIR in the middle. There's a new thing in there um, up here, device three, and there's sort of a this is sort of a change from uh, a previous like approach where like the block would you know do all everything UHG related. Um, that works if you have like one USB source or sync, but like here we have several blocks that are all communicating with the device. So we need to sort of like we have like this is sort of the controller instance of the whole thing, and then the actual blocks they uh, make use of that. And um, so blocks are connected as usual and you know they do what they, what they say but you can see like these blocks, the ones that are called RFNOC, they actually have uh, a different kind of port. So this is sort of where you can sort of start um, connecting stuff on the FPGA. So the, so the dash line here is actually a connection that is not handled by new radio, there's no like buffers involved. So this will actually set up the, uh, the um, crossbar to do whatever it's supposed to do. In this case, like we have just like a FIFO in there to sort of make the whole demo a bit more interesting. And um, sort of in the back end, like, you know, UHD sort of gets told about this connection, then does, does everything like set up flow control and, and the routing um, to, make this, to make this work. Um, just wondering, yeah, okay. So everything else was already answered in the questions. Um, yeah, just like quick reminder, like if you want to sort of Think about you know making this sort of um, how can we sort of feed this back into Kinradio? We'll be talking about this in the working groups. Actually, both working groups later today. Okay, and um, Jonathan, who's been doing all the F cool FPGA magic along with Matt, um, will be actually doing the demo now, and I'll just give you the mic. Um, so one thing that's interesting to note on here though is this noise source is coming into the crossbar. Um, also, you could have a radio that's hooked up to the crossbar as your source as well. But this is, in this case, like saying the FIR filter, a really interesting uh, case where you can generate some signals locally on your computer, and then send them into RF NOC through the crossbar, and then come back onto the host to do further analysis. So you know, there might be some cases where you have, uh, like I said, like a turbo decoder or something like that, where you want to do acceleration through RF NOC. Um, now that would be like one very interesting use case. So right now I'm trying to get my network to work for me. So, actually, okay. Is there any like you know, radio specific questions, something I can answer, Jeff? Well, I'm curious about the, the FIFO block. Do you need that block to get the data down to RFNOC? Oh, actually, yeah, no, sorry, I was actually gonna talk about that. So, um, so ingress and egress, like how do we handle that? Um, so, but every behind every rectangle here, there is a GNU radio block. There is a well, it's, it's, it's always the same code, obviously, but there's like one instance of a GNU radio block running here, and um, we don't actually need to specify ingress or egress because that is in, like obvious by the type of connections. So in GNU radio companion, like could you just like pull that out of it? Thanks. Um, so if we're using like the colored connections and the solid lines, then it's a GNU radio connection, and if we're using the other blocks, then it's an RF not connection, and because like so. Yeah, this is why we actually put that block in here. We don't need the FIFO. We could just like left it out, but that would have made like given us no dashed line line to show you. So we could we can add more in between, um, but we can like this is clear that we have a we have an ingress operation here and an egress operation here, and this is something else entirely. So um, we don't need you know like like a, like a gatekeeping block or something like that. Yeah. Uh, why do you need the throttle in this particular? Ah. Um, well, we don't have a we don't have a clock in here, so um, you know you think like oh hardware, so we don't use throttles. Yeah, that's not entirely true. Like we. Um, well, I didn't know if you already handled the flow control in some other way. Yeah. So um, I mean like we. UHD sync 
we would be like we would be um, bounded by Ethernet speed in this case, but um, you know this just like lets us you know run at the rate that we actually want it because the fi the fire the FIR filter doesn't have a, a good clock in there. Oh, but once the FIFO filled up, it would back pressure. Yeah, yeah. It's just to um, to clarify this, because there's no radio, there's nothing with a synchronous nature in this, and so if we didn't have a throttle there, then what would happen is we would generate. 300 mega samples per second on the hose because that's what the hose can send to the user. The 300 mega samples per second would go through the FIFO if it could keep up with it, which I, I, this actually would keep up at about 200. And then that 200 mega samples per second would get, get sent back to the FFT. And that's just more than we needed in, in this demo. So, uh, so the throttle does that. So if, like anything that doesn't involve the radio itself in conventional GNU radio, if you're just doing a what we would call a SIM or a file to file kind of operation, you, you put a throttle. Because this the fact that it's on the FPJ is, is essentially transparent to what you're doing in this case. We, we, the next demo has an actual radio in it, so there's no problems. Yeah, so you use the throttle for the exact same reason that you use the throttle on any other flow graph. And you just actually validated my slide on the on the internet. Like <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like one more question before we yeah. Yeah, for the connections between a uh, new radio block to back to the the radio of the FPGA, is that UDP or TCP? It's UDP. It's, it's it's exactly the same kind of connection that we that we have for anything else so far. There's no no additional magic happening here. Like like when you like the bot when you buy a U X300 right now, it, it'll do exactly the same kind of transport mechanism. Um, that it already does. Okay, okay so let's see the demo. Yep, yep. So here we can see we have uh, an FIR filter up here. Uh, so since I'm sending in Gaussian noise, we should have a nice flat noise response, but since I'm filtering it, you can see the outline of the filter. Um, one interesting thing to note up here is the fact that I have this coefficients. Um, one of these things about these, um, like an FIR filter and an FPGA, it would be nice to be able to change the coefficients at runtime. And with RF not the way we have it set up, you can. So I have some coefficients actually ready to go. And uh, one thing that we want to do too is, you know, integrate this with GNU Radio where you can use, you know, the filter tools to actually generate those coefficients. But for, for this demo right now, uh, I'm just going to copy paste. Can you set an arbitrary number of caps? So, no you cannot because in the FPGA, right. you'd have to do a new design right. for that. Okay. Now, with partial reconfiguration though, <laughs> that would be possible. Well, also the fur filter, so the one that's actually built in there has, I think, 80 taps. So sure, you can do sure. anything up to 80. Right, of course. Uh, but it, it, uh, it's a, we actually just wrapped the Xilinx yeah. core. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but if you wrapped one that could do variable stuff. And, you know, yeah, I mean, in this case, like, if you wanted a smaller one, which I don't know why you would, but if you wanted a smaller one, obviously you could set some of your taps to zero, something like that. Um, so you can see that it did, when I applied these new taps, um, what actually happened on the FPJ side of things is that we sent a special sort of like command uh, packet over into RF knock over to our FIR filter block, which it then loaded up these, co it had the, the coefficients in it and it loaded up into this FIR filter block that had the support for reloading coefficients. Um, and just to show and go back. Again. Thanks. Oh, I didn't copy them. Uh, and there you can see it goes back. Um, so this is the FIR filter. Uh, you know, it's a pretty interesting case here uh, for FPGA acceleration, especially for FIR filters because they're highly parallel, actually, in an FPGA. Um, they're pipelined where you can have all these parallel uh, VSP units, like Thaddeus was saying in the previous talk, um, that can all kind of work together in lockstep. Whereas on, say, a processor, you have a limited number of ALUs. And so as a FIR filter taps increase a number, then it ends up that you know, your utilization of these LUs will increase until eventually you can't keep up. Uh, yeah, so like I was saying, um, so on the, FI, or on the FPGA, you have a lot more DSP units. Like some of the ones that, that are available today, you have you know, a thousand plus. Um, 
I don't know if you want to you know, put this all towards an FIR filter, but you can definitely produce larger FIR filters uh, on a PGA that can run pretty fast. Um, although, you know, modern processors are also quite quick too, so there, there is some trade-offs there. Can you do IR filtering? IR? Sure, yeah, you can definitely do IR filtering on an FPGA. Um, so this particular, um, as Matt said before, this particular uh, filter is a Xilinx Corgen, which is super fast. I'm not sure that they have an IR. Or IR IIRs are really hard because they're intrinsically hard to pipeline. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to get high cloud rates out of the hardware. Yeah. And by the time you pipeline a FIR filter, yeah, you know, FPGAs, it's a very interesting area where if you don't have a lot of experience behind it, there's some new things to learn, but the benefits are definitely worth the effort. So that was the FIR filter demo. demo. We also have an FFT demo. So in this case, I'm actually coming from the radio, which is a block that's attached to the uh, crossbar. And then it's going to go um, from the radio over to the FFT block and then back to the host for plotting. Um, in this case, though, since it's an FFT output that's a vector, I'm actually going to go into, and this is a shout out to Ballant, to its neat little vector plot sync for the, the uh, WX uh, GUI toolkit. So this will do a nice vector plot for us and we'll see the uh, FFT. So let's, uh, and also, um, you can see something interesting up here too is that these have changed, these types. Um, I'm not, I don't think Martin mentioned that, but the fact that you know, in the FPGA, uh, we're doing everything fixed point, um, but then it gets converted to floating point once you get up to the host. Of course, you, know, that may not, you may not always want that. You may want fixed point from the FPGA up to the, the host's fixed point. Other things that we're looking at too is you, know, you, might, you may want floating point in the host itself, or I'm sorry, in the uh, FPGA itself, which floating, it's interesting that floating point computation takes more resource on the FPGA, but the dynamic range might be useful in certain cases. So let's run this guy. So right now I'm looking at um, the ISM band, and I'm going to start a B200 so I have a nice reference signal here to look at. Oh, <laughs> that's to load the image. So I can just talk about this for a second. Um, so in this case, like I said, we see the, the uh, ISM band. And uh, what, one thing that I brought up is the fact that this is a uh, fixed point in here. So what you may notice, and I'll kind of exemplify this a little bit more, is you can see like the noise floor kind of like bounces up sometimes. If you pay really close attention, I could probably, uh, probably even put the peak hold on here. Um, and occasionally, like you'll get these spikes of somebody transmitting out there. Since you're a fixed point, you have a, a fixed amount of dynamic range. And um, the FFT, the, therefore, since you have this fixed amount of dynamic range, if you're not careful with um, the way you design your FFT and truncating per stage because it has bit growth, you could overflow internally. So um, let's see where this is at. So it's almost there. So what we'll see um, once this is up and running is that once you send in too much of a signal, you'll see this whole thing just, just start to look really weird. And when I was first doing this FFT design, I actually didn't have that in mind when I, when I was sending signals in. I thought, oh wow, the FFT, you know, something's broken, I'm getting garbage data out, when in reality I need to lower my input signal level. And I think some, oh, so here's our signal right here. So um, in this case, I'd already set it up before the demo to look really nice. Um, but if I were to increase the gain here, just really jack it up, you know, wow, you know, we're stuck still at, it's like zero dBm is like the limit up here. And now it looks like, uh, it doesn't look very good, and if I decrease, the gain back down, it looks great again. So um, that, that's one thing to consider you know, when you're doing FPGA development with fixed point, is that you will have these sort of dynamic range issues. You could have overflows and things like that. Um, there's also the other side too here, where if I decrease the gain all the way on here, we start to see little spikes here that are going down, just looks like negative infinity. Well, turns out that the FFT block, if um, you have a low enough signal, it will output zeros in certain bins. The log of zero, of course, being negative to infinity. That's why we're seeing these really deep nulls. Loading point, you wouldn't see that. So that's just something interesting that you should uh, keep in mind here um, when you start working with things like RF knock or other FPGA acceleration. OK, so um, another thing that I would like to show is um, you, you just have a basic FFT here. But another thing that a lot of people do here have to use is you window it. And we can see on, on this guy right here that he has a fairly, um, a fairly sharp peak. 
and it might be, a, let me see if I can set the gain here properly so we can, I'm not able to see it very well because the noise is a little high, but you can see it does have a nice sharp peak. What would be interesting is to apply a window. Well, with RF knock and uh, the new radio um, companion integration, what we want to do is um, be able to just drop blocks down. So let me go ahead and search for RF knock. Yeah, yeah, I was going to show that over here you can see that we have a listing of these different RF knock blocks. Oh, is, is, are you having trouble hearing? Or are you going to hold for me? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so we have the window one here. Now, Fallen Saul has got my back. <laughs> Um, so I've already kind of preset this up to make sure it's, you know, don't have too many snap foods here in the presentation. Um, so you can just drag and drop your block here. I've added this text box so I can set the coefficients while it's running. So we'll go ahead and hook this up. And now it's, it's that simple. And now we're going to go from the radio to a window block to an FFT. And it's important to know that I already have an image on the uh, X300 that has this window block in there. Now, by default, um, before, you know, you think of it having just like kind of like a, a boxcar sort of window. Now, I've applied the Blackman window, and we see that we now have this really nice, tight peak. There's no more, the side lobes have been attenuated quite a bit. But what if I just decide to go back to the boxcar, which I can do pretty easily just by giving it a constant set of coefficients. So if we apply that, we can see, oh, the peak has now tightened up. But it, it's sort of kind of uh, the bottom there, you can see that the silos kind of did come out a little bit. Now we, we do have a lot of noise, so you're not seeing um, the, the typical, like if we were just uh, had no noise at all, you would, you would definitely see even more of the silos. But you can see right here that there's another case that you can create a block and at runtime change some parameter on it. And that's probably gonna be one of the most powerful things in my opinion with uh, RF knock is that you have the FPGA acceleration, but you have the runtime configuration as well. Um, not only from just the blocks themselves, but the fact that you can reconfigure the crossbar. So there, there's definitely interesting applications out there where you may want to reuse certain blocks um, depending on what sort of like modulation scheme you're looking at um, or your application. So that right there kind of concludes the demo. Um, now that you've seen some more, I'm sure there's more questions. So go ahead. And I'm on the FPG site a lot, so I can probably give you some good details. Uh, I don't know if this might be a more of a Mark question, but uh how are tag streams and the tag propagation uh, handled when they transition into the FPGA? Yeah, so um, I guess that's something we can sort of talk about. So right now, right now we just like we just consume a tag and it was it would just vanish. So the the radio um, block, what it right now doesn't do, but um, like this will definitely be added as like it should behave like the user of source that it sort of emits like the current frequency and that kind of stuff. But we can think of we can think of uh, ideas. We can think of um, reasons to add tags in there. But like maybe we want to set the coefficients for the FIR through a tag. Um, the only downside, well, I, I, I don't want to call this a downside, but like the only issue there is that you have to write a GNU radio block for every RF knock block, and that just like increases the amount of code that you want to have. But I mean, obviously, if the benefits you get out of it are, are worth it, then then you should do that. There's absolutely no reason not to do that. Well, I guess I'm most interested in like burst stream. Oh yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we we have the possibility to um, identify end of burst from from st for stuff coming out of the uh, out of RF knock. So for example, Matt's been working on um, you know FTM burst synchronization um, and a block like that. You know, just like to give you a very very briefly technical background, like we need to know that this is bursty data, and then we can like then we just like have an infinite timeout, for example, because like you know, so coming from the radio, we we wouldn't do that. And that way, um, like we already like the metadata that comes with the data coming from UHD already has this like demarcation, like end of burst, and then we just like translate that into a tag. Um, it's not in there at this specific second, but it's like really simple uh, thing to add. So, uh, so yeah, the timestamps are propagated, um, and the only thing you need to watch out for. So, so you, the intention is to be able to do all of that. The uh, you know, MIMOs is a big focus for us. Um, 
The issue is when you get through to a block that, let's say, decimates or has a variable rate, um, you need to in, in, intelligently handle the timestamps. So um, in some cases, if your block is doing something weird enough, you'll need to manually do that. Um, and that, but the, the generic wrapper, if you write a simple block that's just a, a FIFO in and out, and actually, can you show the, the code for the FFT yeah. block? Um, it, it automatically handles those and it will propagate them for you. And you also, only when you're doing something, it's, it's equivalent to a GR sync block. If you're doing a GR sync block equivalent, it, it does it. If you're doing a GR generic, you know, a generic block, just plain GR block, if you're familiar with the API, then you may need to handle the timestamps yourself. Uh, but the start of burst, end of burst stuff is all propagated through the whole system. So this is, uh, yeah, or here, one, oh, yeah, I was, yeah, so I can kind of walk us through the code. This, so this is for the FFT block. Um, one thing that we've really stressed on the RF knock, so that, first of all, let me point out, this is called knock block FFT. So um, one thing that we're really stressing is that for the users, you have a very simple sort of template that you can go off of with the sort of, um, what, what we have that's handling our overhead for routing and, and such, um, already in these knock blocks that you don't have to worry about. From your perspective as a user, you just want a simple data bus that's just you know data, data valid, and then uh, when you're sending it back, you just have data and data ready. You know something very, very simple. You you don't want to get into the details here. So in this case, um, right here, this is sort of the interface that's coming from the crossbar. So th this is part of the interface that you really don't pay much attention to. It goes in and out of the crossbar. It, it looks very similar to um, like an XE stream if you're in a, into like the FPGA side of things. That's what you'll probably notice. Um, the next thing to point out here is this is called the RF knock shell. This is handling um, a, lot, a lot of things that are that are going on in the uh, like with the the Vita side of things, like the cheddar um, header and things. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. So um, those that don't know, this is written in Verilog. Um, there isn't a VHDL uh, equivalent of this, and in fact, you know, it really isn't necessary from the tools side um, standpoint because you can mix VHDL and Verilog um, separate files, of course, not in the same. Um, so this knock shell here that we're calling is taking care of a, um, sort of the communication with the crossbar um, and, and like the headers and such like that. We can see some interesting oh, yeah, flow control as well as in here. Um, it's going to break out certain packets into special what we call streams. So we have um, like this command sort of string coming out here. Then we have this, this string um, sync data and our stream source data. And this would be sort of the data that you would look at. Um, if you just wanted to interface with that particular one. However, as a lot of FPGA design engineers, uh, what we like to do is use pre-generated cores. We don't want to always have to generate everything. A lot of the Zynlinks cores and a lot of uh, other vendors actually have standardized with the Axie bus, spe specifically the Axie stream bus. And that's what we have right here is this Axie wrapper. So it's taking um, what's coming out of an ox shell into, into this guy right here, and then he's spitting out these Axie stream buses that are very standard. Um, and as well, you're getting out more than just one bus. A lot of these components need several buses, some for data, some for configuration. And down here, we have actually the configuration bus. And I, and I had to set up with a parameter where you can have multiple buses. So you know, a lot, some components take two, three, four, whatever. And it's all there for you to be able to um, use multiple buses. So finally, in the user code section, we have my, um, ax, my Xilinx generated Axie stream component for the FFT. And all I did um, was just hook it up right here. I mean, when you take when you get the template code, your template code would essentially, if you're doing an Axie stream device, would be all this highlighted right here. You just come down here and say, okay, I already have my data bus, my my T valid T ready, and for a lot of Xilinx generated cores and, and other vendors as well, you would just hook it up and it would work. Especially like these configuration buses. You know, I'm setting these from the host side. I'm not worrying about an FPGA. I've done previous projects where I had a configuration bus and I had to have some state machine in the FPGA to control that. Um, not in this case at all. You know, you can do it on the host side, no problem. So you would you wouldn't worry about the arbitration of the bus? It's taken care of by the yeah, yeah, yeah. So arbitration of the bus and everything is taken care of. Um, one thing that Matt had mentioned is before things get kind of brought from the crossbar or pushed into the crossbar, the all of RF knock is paying, with flow control is paying attention to can we send this packet into the crossbar and will it make it to that host? You know, do they have room for it at the host? 
whatever the consumer is, I guess you could say. So the producer is not gonna just throw something out there and hope it makes it. You know, it's gonna know that there's room available. Any more questions? Question, yeah. So, so far on the GRC demo, we've seen single input, single output compute engines as GRC blocks. Is this, I recall there only being one FICO in and one FICO out mm -hmm. compute engine. So how is, if I got a multiple input block that I can want to put in this? Yeah, so um, everything is set up to, uh, to handle that. Um, uh, in, including in the addressing, you're given uh, per port on the crossbar, you actually have 16 logical addresses on each one. So you could have 16 completely separate streams uh, and it will handle that. We don't have any demos with that and it's, it's uh, not very well tested. Uh, but the current wrapper, so the simple wrapper that we're showing there is a, is a one in, one out. Um, there will be a two in, two out, you know, a parameterizable wrapper to handle more ports. So you can have an arbitrary number of streams or, or you can have an arbitrary number of streams. It's easiest if it's 16 or less, uh, but more than one is uh, is coming. 